the Art of Leadership Network. That's the cost. And, and life began to feel profoundly unsafe for me, mostly joy, because I just couldn't trust, I couldn't embrace it, because I was sure that if I did, it would be ripped from my hands. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Hey, friends. Thanks so much for joining me this week for episode 284 of the podcast, where today, marriage and family therapist, my good friend, Nicole Zazowski, joins us to talk about the fear of disappointment and loss, and also why shame is as self-absorbed as pride. Yeah, you heard me say that. In fact, I'm going to say it again. We're going to talk about why she believes shame is as self-absorbed as pride. You know, guys, I think a really common experience for many of us is the fear of enjoying a moment of life too much, a celebration in life too much because history tells us, our personal experiences tell us that loss or pain must be on the way. It's too good to be true. What's behind that? Well, that's exactly where we're headed today with Nicole. But first, recently I announced that my podcast joined the Art of Leadership Network with my good friend, Carrie Newhoff. Well, today, I want to let you know that I'm going a bit deeper with what's going on over at the Art of Leadership. If you haven't heard, the Art of Leadership Academy is brand new, and it's an online learning community with the courses, strategies, and insights you need to grow your personal leadership capacity. Now, you might be saying, Chris, I'm not a leader anywhere. Listen, I get that, but what I do know is that all of us can grow better in our personal capacity, in managing our time and energy, and in leveraging our strengths to maximize our contribution to those who matter most in life. So whether you're leading a family, a relationship, or just yourself, there's always an opportunity to grow toward your very best. Listen, I hope to see you there because I'm in the academy as one of the community leaders and specialists. Listen, between qualified experts and peers in the community, the insights, thoughts, and strategies being shared every single day are vital to anyone who wants to grow as a leader. So right now, go to artofleadershipacademy.com. That's artofleadershipacademy.com. And the moment you sign up, you get access to a growing library of premium on-demand courses, monthly live coaching with Carrie Newhoff and me and the other team, and premium community with other leaders facing the same challenges and opportunities that you're facing today. So go to artofleadershipacademy.com to learn more and gain instant access at a surprisingly low price. And don't forget, use the promo code WIN today. Again, artofleadershipacademy.com. I hope to see you there. Well, listen, you've heard enough from me right now. I'm excited to jump straight away into this conversation. So right now, buckle up. Here's my conversation with my good friend, Nicole. Zazowski on the fear of disappointment and why shame is as self-absorbed as pride. Buckle up, it's a good one. Get ready. Here's my conversation with Nicole Zazowski. You're listening to Win Today on the Art of Leadership Network. Nicole, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, I have been looking forward to this since we hung up a couple of years ago. So thanks for having me back. I'm Nicole. I'm just really excited that you're here today. And here's where I want to start because you, you said to me before we hit record here today that our last conversation has just been lingering with you. I'd love to know why. Well, <laughs> to be honest, first of all, uh, you're just a very good interviewer, oh, and so I, I just really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I felt like I was talking to a friend, and a lot of the content, we went deep real fast and in terms yeah. of emotional regulation and um, how to have peace and joy outside of circumstance and um, a lot of what I do as a therapist. Mm-hmm. And so just it, it was a conversation that stayed with me Um Almost, almost in a back to the basics kind of way. Not, not that what we said was super basic, but um, for me as a therapist, it was just such a good reminder of um, how to have that peace and joy, mm-hmm. regardless of what circumstances might look like at a given time. And since you and I have talked, the world has been all over the place. <laughs> so true. 
Um, and so it, it was your comments on what I shared um, and the the content of what we talked about um, just has come to mind several mm-hmm. times over the last few years. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, Nicole, the last time we did talk was in the middle of uh, 2020 and then 2021 mm-hmm. hit. And for a lot of people, it was like, the backhand slap a little bit. I mean, it was hard yeah. for a lot of people. I'd love to know just how was 2021 for you? What's been going through your heart, through your head? What have clients been bringing to you, you know, in the last 12 months? Oh, I have so many <laughs> answers running through my brain. It's hard to know what to say first. Um, I, I feel like 2021, either consciously or subconsciously, A lot of us were putting our celebration on the far side of a goal achieved or a dream realized or a new set of circumstances. And we sort of, we we know when we really think about it, that there's nothing magic about turning the page on a new year. Like it's a, it's another day. We write a different date on our, you know, planners and, and calendars and all of that, but it's not, it's not as if something inherently magic happens when you step into a new year. And yet I think it's a natural transition for us to think about new beginnings, to evaluate our current lives, what needs to go, what needs to stay. And it's a natural place to kind of turn our heart toward hope and expect expectancy. Mm -hmm. And I think the unhealthy version of that and the reason that hope was so scary for me for so long was that I had unintentionally hinged my hope on those three things I just mentioned, a change Mm -hmm. in my circumstance, Mm -hmm. achieving a goal, or realizing a dream. And the sad part of about that for me, as I listen to clients share similar stories and as I've experienced it in my own life, is the empowerment (laughs) is completely taken away when our peace and joy and hope are hinging on circumstances that we largely cannot control. Um, And so I feel like 2021 for me and a lot of people in my practice and a lot of people in my personal life um, was a a reintroduction (laughs) to that idea that we just, um, we cannot place our peace and joy and hope on the far side of circumstances, goals, or dreams. Right, right, for sure. I'm just curious about this. Why do a lot of people struggle on New Year's Eve with mm-hmm. just depression, and anxiety? What is it about New Year's Eve heading into a new year that for some people is not exhilarating at all, but it's actually it causes a lot of anxiety. What do you think is behind that? I mean, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but I'm just curious. Oh, well, you're asking the expert because I absolutely hate New Year's. And I know that's a strong word. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan either. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go there. I'm learning, I'm learning to love it. Um, maybe love is too strong in this context too, but I, I am learning to move through it differently. I'll, I'll say that. But Um, this is the first year where New Year's hasn't almost given me a panic attack. And I don't say that, I don't throw that term around um, because I know it's a a real condition, a real experience that's very specific. But I am filled with anxiety often on New Year's. And I think it's because mainly because of what I just talked about. We we all want a reason to celebrate. We want a reason to feel joy. And we, a lot of us are just going into the new year hoping mm-hmm. <laughs> that we'll have a reason to do so. And not that hope is a bad thing. Hope is always a good idea um, in the context of our relationship with Christ. But Um, when our hope again is hinging on specific things, then it's not just, I already know I'm valued. I already know I'm secure. And from that place, I am going to pursue this dream and goal that sounds really fun and that God is calling me to. 
most of us are going into the new year. I need to pursue that goal and dream for my significance and for my security. It's a, it's an ordering thing. Um, also for me, I'll speak for myself, but I, I know that, you know, I, I talk to many people who have their own version of this. I think for me, often it's anxiety producing because my loves are in the wrong order. I call them disordered love, um, where I'm expecting more joy from a gift than it was meant to give. So it is not a bad thing to, and I, I go into detail on the, in this on my book, um, it is not a bad thing to celebrate when we achieve that goal or that dream is realized mm-hmm. or we're given a gift that just feels so exciting. We absolutely should celebrate that. We absolutely should enjoy that. However, if we're expecting more joy from the gift than it was meant to provide, um, Jesus warns that we're going to feel empty pretty quick. Um, and I think that's where a lot of my anxiety around tr- New Year's, but transitions in general come mm-hmm. into is my disappointment that I fear so much is not usually a result of a no. It's the result of expecting more joy from something than it was meant to provide. Mm. Well, this is interesting because I think this is really common <laughs> for a lot of listeners today. And mm-hmm. it is the fear of enjoying a moment, a season, a circumstance too much because something in, on the inside of us tells us, oh, this is actually probably too good to be true. So loss or pain has to be on the way. That's just the the story mm-hmm. of my life. And so we build ourselves up and there's this lurking dread behind the joy. What's behind that, Nicole? Mm. Yeah, so the whole premise of my my book, What If It's Wonderful, really starts with that question. Mm-hmm. Because when you and I last talked, you know, we, we talked about a book that was largely about a season of loss and pain, um, waiting you know, with some of those more difficult life experiences. And it was a pretty prolonged season for me. I don't, I don't feel like any of our seasons are either all pain or all joy, but certainly we all live seasons that tend to lean one direction or another. And, and it was a pretty long season of chronic loss and and disappointment and devastation even. Um, And what I didn't realize was the, somebody asked me a really healing question um, in the midst of that. And they said, what has this cost you, Nicole? And I thought, well, it's cost me, you know, initially my thought process was it's cost me time. It's cost me pain in my relationships. It's cost me, um, you know, getting to meet those, those babies that I lost to miscarriage. It's, you know, cost me the dream that I had for my family. And those were certainly losses that were important to name. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't realize is that the real cost was um, the the fear of joy, the the fear of hope, um, not wanting to take a chance on celebration for fear that it always came with a catch. And so the cost is not just the trigger event, it's the impact to our sense of security and our identity. So if we ask ourselves, how did I feel about myself? Or how do I feel about my circumstances or this relationship as a result of what happened? That's the cost. And and life began to feel profoundly unsafe for me. Um, Mostly joy because I just couldn't trust. I couldn't embrace it because I was sure that if I did, it would be ripped from my hands. I think you just gave us context for a statement that you, you made in your book. And it was this, you said, Mm -hmm. I was sure that celebration always came with a catch. So Mm -hmm. I became practiced in praying for the miracle while preparing to mourn. 
I mean, Nicole, to the extent you're comfortable, unpack that a little bit more and even bring it to the plate for people today who are having to negotiate, well, feeling like they have to negotiate this, praying for, expecting, um, anticipating something good, but at the same time, preparing to mourn, preparing to lose. Mm-hmm. I, you know, later in our conversation, I want to talk about actually something from Proverbs 15, which is a mm. foreboding spirit of dread. And I think a lot of that fuels this, but parse this out, Nicole, in context of your own story, to the extent you're comfortable. Yeah, I, um, this concept of, you said foreboding dread, Brene Brown has a term called foreboding joy, um, which is such an odd juxtaposition in, in one phrase. Uh, and, and she would tell you based on her research that joy is actually the most vulnerable feeling we feel because once you hold something, it can be taken away. And we see this in lots of different ways. We see this when people receive a compliment. How many times have you given somebody a compliment and they've said something like, oh, you're just being sweet or, oh, you're catching me on a good day or you should ask my husband and kids what they think or, <laughs> you know, it's, it's deflected. And that's just in receiving a simple, you know, string of kind words. Um, let we see this even with tangible gifts, you know, people are often vulnerable receiving, you know, opening a present. We just had the holidays. So we had a lot of gift giving and some people are really good at receiving. Um, but I think that that is not, does not tend to be the norm. And so, um, for me, joy became a scary experience because I was, sure that I would have further to fall, um, when it inevitably didn't work out. And so I, that pessimism or that dread that you were talking about is really more of a form of control. Um, so it's trying to keep yourself safe by having low expectations and protecting yourself from disappointment by learning to not hold joy, not expect anything, decide that hope is a bad idea, and you'll just be, you can only ever be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> the problem is, yeah, this does not protect you from disappointment and mm-hmm. devastation. You're still going to experience that when sad or hard things happen in life. We're not robots. Um, we're, we're going to have feelings following events like that. However, you will protect yourself from a lot of delight. And that I could cry talking about that part because that has been the biggest cost um, for me is in this refusal to celebrate, refusal to take a chance on joy and hope is it's cost me so much um, in terms of connection with my loved ones. It's cost me so much um, where my eyes were cast down on what wasn't happening instead of having my gaze available to catch what was happening. And there was a lot of beauty going on that I, by God's grace, I didn't miss all of it. but I missed a lot of it because I was too busy being hyper vigilant for what might happen um, or what wasn't happening. And it cost me a ton of delight and, and opportunities to celebrate the life that I had. I don't at all want to put you on the spot, your friend. Please do. And I care about you. Well, I care about you a ton. And and I I guess what I just want to say is what did it cost you? I mean, Mm. you just take us, take us as deep as you're comfortable, Nicole. But this is such a common experience for listeners that I think it might be helpful for them to hear, oh my gosh, almost like a reflection for their own lives. Like what, what did this cost you, Nicole? It cost me a lot of connection in my marriage. Um, my husband was eager to celebrate a lot of things with me and my brain and my words would immediately go to, well, but this didn't happen or, 
yeah, we'll see what comes of it. Or, um, you know, even, even when we got pregnant with some of our kids, some of which we have and some of which we did not get to meet, but I, I missed the joy regardless of the outcome. I missed the joy of celebrating that news with him. Um, and where he was eager to celebrate that life. And um, I was so afraid that I wouldn't get to meet that child. Um, but we, we learned to celebrate together and grieve together. And the joy that came from that, the, the togetherness in both of those experiences um, was something really rich that we were able to experience more recently. Um, but, you know, and I, I think about that verse all the time that, that God is restoring the years and it doesn't make sense to me in, in human math, but I, I know that with God math, um, he is able to do that. And I just, I trust, um, that, that he restores in, in those ways, but I missed a lot. I missed, um, connection with my, the kids that I had, um, that I did, that I did get to meet and, and get to play with and delight in every day. Um, for a lot, for, I, I carry a lot of fear as a mom, um, and that I have to constantly work through and self-regulate and, uh, lean into God's truth in the midst of my fear, because, uh, I'll just be brutally honest. I hope that's okay. Of course, um, of course it is illogically there's this narrative for me that if I didn't lose them in utero before they were born, that I'm just waiting to lose them after they're born. And I don't, I often that will come up in nightmares <laughs> um, where I can tell that fear is lingering. It's not something I'm confronted with on a daily basis but, you know, if my baby sleeps too long, um, not too long, but longer than usual, um, I'm just sure that that she won't wake up um, or just these these little narratives that have really been um, a lot of fear to process that I'm not sure I would have had had my story been different, had life felt not felt so unsafe. Um, but now that you know, those are the, the wounds that I carry. I am grateful that I do have a choice in what I do with them. I, I did not have a choice in how they got there. <laughs> um, and of course the wounds are not my fault. They're not any listener's fault. If, if you're thinking of your own version of my story, um, cause obviously this applies to many different situations. I have a ton of clients who, really had some difficult experiences with men and have been introduced to wonderful men, not perfect men because nobody is, but wonderful, trustworthy, loving, kind men. And that they have a hard time receiving um, that love and kindness and trustworthiness because uh, of their previous experiences. So we all have a story um, if we think about it, that that has given us messages that are not so helpful in terms of feeling safe and feeling significant as a human being. And um, I would challenge myself and challenge any listener to think about your story and think about the cost to your identity and sense of safety and how that might be bleeding out in your life. Now we have a we may have even talked about this last time. I can't remember, but we have a, a phrase in therapy called right script, wrong players, where we tend to take a script that was really painful from another season or different relationship in our lives and play it out with innocent parties or other circumstances where it's not the case, but we play the same script over and over again. And we have to correct uh, those messages, um, so that we can walk in freedom, um, moving forward and that we're not causing harm to mm -hmm. future, future or other relationships. Like I definitely have done. Um, and 
yeah, because I've, I've been really fearful. Hmm. Nicole, you said all of us have a story. And, and I think just as a point of reflecting what I heard you say back to you, um, is that for many of us, the narrator of that story could be fear, specifically mm-hmm. the spirit of fear. And I think the most dominant fear is the fear of losing control. And so what I heard you say is often, oftentimes the coping mechanisms, the things we do to cope with the fear inside actually cause us more trouble in the long run mm-hmm. than if we face those things head on. So number one, did I hear you correctly in that? Am I, am I putting a correct biopsy on that? And then number two, I want to head in the direction of really just drilling down on dread. <laughs> yes, you heard me correctly. I think the, the wounds of, um, so some examples of identity wounds would be not good enough, yes. worthless, um, you know, unworthy, uh, insignificant, not important. Mm-hmm. Some examples of safety wounds would be unsafe, powerless, helpless, mm-hmm. alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so really understanding what are the messages that my story has given me. And yes, we, and this might be repeat from last time too, but just to review, we, um, cope with those messages in one, two, three, or all four of four ways. Um, and this is based on the model I use in restoration therapy. Um, so it's uh, blame other people, uh, shame yourself, control. Um, and there's lots of ways to do that or escape. And there's lots of ways to do that. Um, so the, the dread I would put under the category of control, which might sound odd um, because when we think of control, we think of like a super type A um, person who's just telling, bossing everybody around and telling everybody how they should be doing their jobs and unable to delegate. And and that certainly is one profile of a controller, uh, but there's a lot of sneakier ones. <laughs> um, and dread is one, particularly when we're using pessimism and cynicism and dread to control our own, the vulnerability of joy or the vulnerability of disappointment. Wow. Wow. Well, so, yeah. It, okay. So just to put a pin on what you said, trauma and the subconscious cannot differentiate between past, present, and future from a physiological standpoint. So we react as if it's happening now and we play it out. Even something that happened 15, 20 years ago, we play it out again uh, currently yes. because of the inability for the subconscious and our and our uh, neurobiology to distinguish between time. Is that is that also true? Yes, absolutely. And some of that depends on the the trauma the severity of yeah. the trauma not to say that it's not significant um but the degree to which that happens might vary but absolutely uh your your brain has no trouble replaying the past and overlaying it onto the present and future um and so dread and you know listen anything we do in our pain any of these coping mechanisms we may hear them and think well None of that is very good or helpful. And mm-hmm. that's true. However, it, we do have to have compassion on ourselves that this is our brain's way of trying to protect us. So it's not, it, it's not attractive behavior. I'll, <laughs> I'll give you that. I don't love how I show up in life and in my relationships when I'm in that coping zone. Um, however, we do have to have compassion that this is our brain's best attempt to try and protect us from those feelings. And over time, we can honor that and lead it into a different way. Um, but we we can't, cor- we, we have to connect before we correct. <laughs> so we, we have to connect with ourselves, connect with other people, um, and have compassion on that emotional experience, what has brought them to this place. Um, before we can hope to slowly pivot in a new direction and trust the truth, trust that, trust that joy that even if we're disappointed, 
um, that there is joy to be had and that there's goodness to be had in that experience. Connect before we can correct is brilliant, Nicole, because I think when we don't connect, we find ourselves trapped in secrecy, shame, Mm -hmm. and isolation. Mm -hmm. You just really uncovered, I think, a huge secret to transformation. I'm on just a, a deep research in a deep research season right now of spiritual formation as both a practitioner and a researcher. And Mm. spiritual formation, formation in and of itself, has to happen in community. Yes. And I'll just bring up shame because shame has been such a dominant topic center. I mean, thanks to the likes Mm -hmm. of Brene Brown, but I mean, for the last 30 years, shame has been such a dominant topic center. But there's an angle to shame that we have to understand. And, And Nicole, this is your words. Shame is just as self-absorbed as pride. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell us about our relationship with the shame conversation in counseling, in self-help, in what you said, we have to connect before we can correct. And the reason I ask is because I believe the goal of every believer, most of the listeners here are believers, are followers of Jesus. And so I believe the goal of every believer is maturity. Mm -hmm. So take us in. Yeah, the oh, shame is a big topic, and it's we we tend to think of it as a feeling. It's it, feeling ashamed is a feeling, um, but it is also an action. And the reason that it's it's a way of talking to ourselves, it's speaking lying words about our identity to ourselves. Um, if you think about, you know, if you put a speaker on the <laughs> the script playing in your brain. Um, shame is sneaky because we say a lot of things to ourselves that we would never say out loud to somebody else. Um, and yet the message is just as damaging. The, the voice we hear loudest and most often is the one inside our own head. So, um, I think we tend to view it as humble in a weird way. (laughs) We tend to think if we're self-deprecating, we're not, we're certainly not harming anybody else um, and just ourselves and to not, I talk about it in the context of celebration because often we're hesitant to celebrate ourselves because um, we're so committed to Mm -hmm. shame. And Mm -hmm. the reason I I actually bring it up a few times in the book in a few different chapters from, from different perspectives. Um, but the reason it's so important is, or worth repeating is because when we're speaking lying words to ourselves and we refuse to receive a message of truth about who we are, there's this commitment to being our own savior. There's there's a lack of a receiving of any sort of value and identity apart from what we earn and what we're able to prove. Um, so I, I had to confront this in my own life when, you know, people say, you know, I just can't forgive myself. <laughs> well, Christ has, you know, proven that you are forgiven on the cross and your inability to forgive, you know, Jesus was the wrecking ball um, that took down any barrier between you and, and acceptance and forgiveness. And so your refusal to, or my refusal to receive that was, is really about a commitment to performance and saving ourselves through our own performance. And so I just have to prove that I'm good enough by being good enough, being impressive enough, making up for what just happened by being all the more dazzling. And that has just as much of a self-focus as pride. And so when we think about, you know, a great example of this in the context of celebration you know, because people are very uncomfortable celebrating themselves. And um, I tell this story in the book, but I'll, I'll briefly tell it here. Um, I, I had a friend who was launching a business and there was like a, a small gathering. Um, but to celebrate her, to celebrate the launch of this business, we had all witnessed, you know, this the seedling idea and then the 
tons of hard work that went into, you know, taking it from an idea to an actual uh, business and then launching that business. And we were so excited to celebrate her. And she did, and she would tell you this, it was the, the oddest reaction um, at the launch party because she was just stomping around um, very uncomfortable when anyone affirmed her. Um, she, and, and later she confessed, I, I didn't know how to celebrate myself and still maintain my value of humility. Um, and I, I had such compassion on her, uh, because it was so clear how uncomfortable she was, but I also know what that's like. I know what it's like to, you know, re receive affirmation and, and it to feel uncomfortable. And what I, but what I've realized for myself is actually a hesitancy to celebrate. I've learned to see this as a clue is a sign I've made it about me. Um, and because we're worried that if we celebrate ourselves, it's going to make it about us, but really a hesitancy to celebrate is a sign I've made it about me because when I recognize that God stored these gifts inside of me and gave me opportunities to use them, mm -hmm. um, this is about the giver. Uh, this is about the giver celebrating the gift with the giver and look what God did. Look how he moved. Look at the way that he created this person um, and how they're using their gifts. Look at how he created me and how I get to use my gifts. This is all to God be the glory. Um, and so a hesitancy to celebrate by shaming ourselves is not only a commitment to be our own savior, but a sign that we've actually made the opportunities and gifts we've been given about us. Um, and that's a paradigm shift for me because I think our culture doesn't really look at it that way. If somebody is celebrating, um, we're quick to, to question their humility or to question, um, you know, if they're self-absorbed when really I, I feel like it's the other way around. So that was a long answer to your shame question, friend. No, it's, <laughs> it, it's great, Nicole, because it probes another question then. This is sort of a survey question then. Do you then see any collective blind spots? And I don't mean this as a generalization, though it's going to sound like one. Do you see any collective blind spots in our culture then as it relates to anything we're doing, like what you just shared, that is stunting our emotional development, maybe even things we call normal, but in fact, they're anything mm -hmm. but normal. Like what have, we, what have we normalized that absolutely is dysfunctional in that way? False, yeah, false humility would be one of them, which um, we just went into. I think what humility looks like um, and, and what, particularly in the context of celebration, C.S. Lewis says, um, and I won't get this exactly right, but the sign of uh, the mark of a gospel humble person, what you would notice about them is how focused they are on other people, how, how able they are to focus on you. Um, and that can only come from a sec being secure, um, and filled up in ourselves. So I think what humility looks like, that it looks like being self-deprecating or shaming, um, is definitely one. I think um, this is a, a little bit of a different angle, but I, I think uh, the lack of ritual in our culture. Okay. Um, what the does Jewish it mean? community. Yeah. The Jewish community is so good at really celebrating, um, you know, coming of age and different markers in a person's life. Um, as a cult, as an American culture, we are just not great at naming moments in time and really celebrating them and honoring the person whose you know birthday it is or uh, whatever the rite mm -hmm. of passage is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, traditions, whether that be 
weekly traditions that we might practice along with Sabbath, that's kind of a natural time to have weekly celebration. Uh, often we talk about what not to do during Sabbath, you know, what to take out of our day instead of putting um, celebration into our day in a way that connects us with other people in a way that helps us, you know, Jewish celebration was all about when, when the Israelites celebrated, it was all about remembrance. It was remembering who God is either like a, a piece of his character or remembering what he had done for them. Um, and along with that, um, an important piece of celebrating and finding joy in my life has been, you know, have digging for delight in my every day. Um, and what I've noticed is the, that becomes the fingerprints of God's faithfulness as I look back. So if, if we're not seeing it in the present, and this goes back to your question of something that, you know, is a blind spot, I feel like we are so quick to move on from a point of progress and keep our eyes fixed on what is left to do. So um, this might be a project we're working on, or it might be personal growth. You know, if I'm looking to grow um, in finding freedom from shame or finding freedom from fear, as I described before, um, you know, being willing to celebrate those points of progress along the way and not just constantly keep your eyes fixed on, but here's how far I have to go. Or here's, you know, this milestone in growing my business is nice, but I want to be here, <laughs> you know, and keeping your eyes constantly focused on what's left or what hasn't happened. Um, you know, not, not stopping to celebrate before we move on to slay the next dream. So, um, those are a few that come to mind readily. Thankfulness is another one. I think that's a blind spot and I'll, I'll raise my hand. I could be better at this one. We, we can't walk into a store without seeing a gratitude journal or a gratitude jar. <laughs> like it, it seems like gratitude along with shame and vulnerability and some of these other topics that we've talked about today. Um, that's another big one that's become a, a mainstream conversation. And it absolutely is so helpful in shifting our perspective toward joy. But it's half the battle. I think what we don't realize is that expressing that gratitude that we feel through thankfulness actually throws gasoline on that joy um, because we get to celebrate the gift with the giver. So this is true in, in human relationships. And this is also true with our relationship with God. I think we're quick to come to him when we have a request and that is a good and right thing to do. Um, I'm quick to come to him in my struggle, but I think we also need to come to him in our celebration and we're missing out when we don't celebrate the gift with the ultimate giver um, through the practice of Thanksgiving. And, and that's one of the main ways that we can celebrate with our creator. I love that. And I want to just ping back to, I think, a dominant driver in this conversation. Okay. If we look at shame, for instance, where does the self-protection, where does the self-promotion come from? So back to mm -hmm. the fear driver then, and this is where we were sharing about uh, your experience of not being able to sit in the present because of fear. Mm -hmm. So I want to take some time just to talk to people listening who are experiencing an unrelenting sense of dread. And listen, mm -hmm. folks, maybe it's because you're struggling with your health right now today. Mm -hmm. And worry about that makes things worse in your body. <laughs> I mean, anxiety mm -hmm. manifests in the body in such weird ways. Mm -hmm. Just don't get on Google, y'all, please. Just don't. <laughs> Um, or maybe your kids are sick and you're just exhausted. Mm -hmm. And as I alluded to, Nicole, Proverbs fifteen fifteen says, all the days of the afflicted are made evil by anxious thoughts or forebodings. So walk us through arresting the spirit of foreboding fear, dread, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then give us some practical steps that we can use throughout the day to stop entertaining it in our hearts. That's a great question. Yeah, so... 
that dread um, would be, if you picture a weed, um, that would be the plant part that we see <laughs> as we're walking by above mm-hmm. ground or another analogy that's often used is, is the tip of the iceberg. And that, that is your invitation to be curious. So if you've related to anything I've shared in my personal journey with how, you know, dread and that forebode, sense of foreboding can, is an attempt to protect you from feeling disappointed and devastated, then that's just an invitation. See it as an invitation to be curious um, because that will not show up. It just won't. It will not show up without first having its roots in either a pain around our identity or a pain around our safety. It could be either. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, based on my work, I would say most likely it's going to fall in that safety column. Um, feeling incredibly powerless. I've tried everything and it's not enough to fix it. Um, feeling like my formulas that I thought I could rely on for life to feel good to me are broken and they didn't work. Uh, they failed. Uh, feeling like life, I, I've just confronted how unsafe life can feel. Um, that we don't know ultimately what today brings and we, uh, the unexpected has happened and ripped the rug out from under me. Um, and I feel incredibly unsafe. Um, here's, here's the tough part about starting to speak truth to feelings that fall in the safety column. And again, this is based on the model I use called restoration therapy. When we talk about safety in terms of our identity, so worthless, not good enough, inadequate, those sorts of feelings. Regardless of how much one might struggle to receive truth, the truth is pretty direct. I think that most of us wouldn't argue with the fact that human beings inherently have value. We might struggle to feel value on a given day, but it's pretty straightforward for most of us that human beings have value. When we look at truth that we can speak to those safety feelings, it gets a little bit more complicated. It's not as direct because is life completely safe? No. Um, so to say you're safe, you have total control, you, you know, and, and the, our culture, this might be another one of those toxic uh, blind spots that we talked about earlier our culture would love for us to believe that we are in control, that if we just try hard enough or do the right things or know the right people, that we can make life feel okay. Climb the right rung on the corporate ladder, you know, whatever it is. But the truth is that life is not completely safe. However, there are three truths that can help us feel secure in an unsafe world. The first is the knowledge that we are not alone. So this will never eliminate the pain, but it will help us move through the pain differently. Um, And one of the reasons that I, I think connecting with God in both our sorrow and celebration is so important because it reminds us, oh, I am never alone. Yes, we have... I think most people who are listening and and you or I would probably, you know, be able to name people in our communities um, that help us feel less alone. We have church communities, we have family, we have friends, we have small groups, um, you know, people we've chosen to do life with. So that's a piece of us not being alone, but certainly regardless of your life circumstances or if you're feeling lonely in terms of human relationships, if you've put your trust in Jesus, you always have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. We are promised that. Hmm. Um, you know, Jesus said, I am, I'm leaving you with something better than myself. Don't be sad that I'm going to be leaving. I'm, I'm leaving you with my spirit. Um, the second is, it's absolutely true that we're not in total control, but we are empowered to make 
choices. Um, and I say this a few different times in my new book um, because of the importance of practice um, in, in terms of really practicing the peace and joy that we long to feel. Uh, our brain will not, left on neutral, our brain goes negative. It will not simply drift toward peace and joy. We have to be intentional about not only speaking truth to ourselves, but practicing some of those habits and, and rituals and um, digging for delight um, that, that will help move us in that direction. But if we think about you know, choices that we are empowered, that God has given us empowerment over and spending our energy there where a lot of us start to feel anxious is when we start trying to spend our energy in things we have not been given control over. And we, we take ourselves off that empowerment and choice that, that God has given us. And, and we start trying to control things, um, that we're not in control of. And when our brain, when we ask our brain to do the impossible, it tries to control with worry. If I just fixate on this enough, if I just worry about this or chew on it or replay that conversation 900 million times, then I will feel better. And it just stirs up that anxiety. You mentioned identity. And I think this is really important because the identity piece plays a huge part in this whole conversation, I think, uh, because mm -hmm. uh, we're negotiating with either truth or we're just, we're waffling at uh, fading circumstances. And mm -hmm. I think in your case, what I learned from you and, and of course in the new book is that you've learned how to sit in your suffering. Now, mm -hmm. this is important. I'd like to ask how so, but what I'm getting at, Nicole, is the difference between being present with it, but not creating an identity out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. So this is the, the third thing in that safety would be if you have to go through it, how can you grow through it? And that's one of the ways <laughs> that identity piece is certainly one of the ways um, that I and anybody else who's related to this story um, can grow through it is, is understanding Yes, I, we have all been through really difficult things in this life. Um, you know, God, God does not promise us an easy life. He promises that we will encounter suffering in different forms. Um, but A, he says, I've overcome it. Um, and so one of the truths I hang on to is what is dark today is not going to be dark forever. Um, so if we are sitting in the midst of our suffering, knowing that the end, this is not the end of the story, um, and the inheritance we've been given in Christ is joy. Um, and so to not, there, there's a difference between feeling disappointed and being a disappointment. We can experience that feeling uh, you know, because we will, we're not, again, we're not robots. We're going to have painful feelings in response to hurtful situations or difficult circumstances. But we have one of the areas we have been given empowerment in is what is the message that I am going to carry forward for myself? And how am I going to choose to take this pain speak truth to it, and show up differently. A, a question I will often ask myself is, how do I want my family to remember me um, during this difficult time? And that, that can sound a little performance, so I, I want to be careful about that. This isn't a performance is showing up a certain way for your value. This isn't about that. This is knowing our value, knowing I am a person um, who is loved and cherished and yes, imperfect, but completely valued. Um, and being able to say, ha, that's the message I'm going to choose to carry forward, even in the midst of my mistakes, even in the midst of a story I wouldn't write for myself. And I'm going to choose to show up 
um, you know, really the opposite of whatever the way that you cope with your pain tends to be. So for me, um, it would be to show up as hopeful um, and and to show up in a way that values myself um, and other people. Um, so that's what it looks like for me, but for others, it might um, look like showing up connecting instead of that tendency to isolate. Um, it might show up as kind and soft with your words instead of angry and blaming. Um, it might show up like taking responsibility for a circumstance instead of deflecting and telling everybody else how they could be different so we could feel better. Um, whatever that looks like for you, that's just a few examples. How how does joy then remain authentic without it becoming mm -hmm. escapism or even denial? Yes. So I definitely address this in my book because I was really, for a long time, I kind of looked at joy as fake, particularly when we talk about joy and celebration in the context of mm -hmm. really hard things. Um, and, and there's this idea of toxic positivity where if you just – think say the right things then you know and i'm going to show up as so joyful woo -woo. yeah all the woo, -woo yeah, stuff yeah exactly i'm going to show up as looking joyful even when it's the opposite of how i feel um and i think joy we have to expand our definition of what joy looks like and we have to expand our vision for it i think joy comes from sitting and connecting with Christ in both our suffering and our celebration. I think joy is the byproduct of connecting with Christ and each other in how we are authentically feeling. Um, and being having eyes to see what is good, even in the midst of things that are really hard. Um, so it's good. Having eyes to see what is good does not mean that you turn a blind eye to what is hard. It's the toleration that both can exist at the same time. Um, you know, in my saddest, most devastating moments, in my most hopeless seasons, I, had, I was given a completely different kind of relationship with Christ than I ever would have had had that story not happened. Um, completely different marriage completely different perspective on my kids. Those are joys. I shouldn't say that they wouldn't have happened because I don't know that for sure, but those are joys I have a hard time picturing being realized outside of the context of the pain that I experienced. And both were true. <laughs> it, it really hurt and really, really good things were happening at that time too and have happened in the wake of what felt broken and lost. Um, you know, things we tend to write off as wrecked and ruined. Um, I've seen a lot of redemption come, come from those things. And that isn't to say that it wasn't hard or it wasn't painful. It's not a denial of the hurt. Um, this isn't about covering up one with the other. It's about allowing both to sit in the same room. I think that's why we get so uncomfortable when we celebrate and we know somebody else is hurting is because, and this would be another blind spot, um, that I'm thinking of now is that we, we have lost the art of being able to do both together. Um, and I think where we get into trouble is when we celebrate or when we mourn without the, um, acknowledgement that the other experience exists. Um, that's where we lose our, our sensitivity chip. <laughs> um, but being able to honor both human experiences and enter both human experiences with our loved ones um, knowing that they they often sit in the same room together. Nicole, you you said that we need to have eyes to see what is good. 
And that, mm-hmm. that just stuck out to me. And I think what that requires is two things. Number one, intentionality. Number two, focus. Now, this, this takes me to a quote from your book, which is this. Joy is not the opposite of discipline. It is the mm-hmm. key to discipline. Mm-hmm. Connect that thought for us. Yeah. So I think for a long time, I wanted joy. I was annoyed that joy was a discipline. I, or that celebration was a discipline. I, I wanted it. I wanted to be surprised by joy. I wanted, um, to wake up and have good things happen to me and feel naturally celebratory Mm -hmm. all day long. Um, but like I said earlier, uh, some joy is like that. And, and by God's grace, he does give us gifts that just pop up and surprise us and delight us. And some, some joy looks like what I would call happiness, but happiness is not, I can't stand it when people make happiness side note here. I can't stand it when people make happiness, the hedonistic version of joy, like it's wrong or bad to be happy. Absolutely not. It is an important piece of um, life's experience and being able to celebrate with other people in our creator. It's just not a complete picture of the joy that's available to us in Christ. Um, Joy is a gift of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And it's also Mm -hmm. cultivating, like you said, that that discipline. And so um, I love that verse from from Nehemiah that says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Um, It's not, you know, we think of strength coming from hardship or, you know, something unpleasant. And I think it certainly can in other, and in some ways, but Nehemiah is really clear. It's the joy. It's delighting in Christ. It's delighting in his movement in our lives. It's delighting in his movement in our hearts um, that keeps us strong and and fortified. Um, and you know, one, one kind of sweet illustration of this is when the pandemic started, I, I don't know how it was <laughs> in your part of the country, but I mean, initially when we were still trying to figure out how this COVID thing worked or what, what was dangerous, what wasn't, you know, every park and beach within an hour radius of me was closed. And when you have two young active boys and (laughs) we didn't have a a super small house, but it wasn't a a particularly large house either. And my husband's working from home. And so I had to be, I had to drive an hour and we were on every beach that I could find on, um, you know, the East, the East coast that I could reasonably drive to on the long Island sound And we started this tradition of going every day and looking for sea glass. Um, And it's a through line in my book. Um, If you read it, you'll, you'll understand all the pieces to it. But what started as a way of entertaining my boys during the long days um, turned into, we have collected these jars of sea glass And they are, I mean, we have thousands of pieces. Mm. And this became my family's daily discipline of delight. And, you know, lots of friends over the years have said, you should make this with that, or you should do something with all of the pieces. And I am surprisingly protective of keeping them in these color coordinated jars because it's like a time capsule for me. I look at those jars And I see the way that God has woven friendship and community and laughter into my family through the many, through that daily discipline of looking for sea glass together. Um, And like I said earlier, the, the discipline of digging for delight becomes the fingerprints of God's faithfulness. And, and that's just an illustration for me when I look at those jars is, Oh, he has been so good to us during a season that I wouldn't have written for anybody um, to be this way, but he has woven such beautiful things into my family. And yes, it's been hard. It's been a hard couple of years for all of us. And I know that that looks different for every single listener, but it has been really, really good too. 
um, God has still been good to us. And I, I say in the book, you know, I think one of the biggest joys is reorient, reorienting our celebration. You know, our, our celebration is now bending, I'm hoping, toward the eternal <laughs> um, aspects of this life, um, toward toward the things of God. And if hardship is, is part of what helps bend, you know, what we celebrate um, in the right direction, then I think that's a beautiful thing. Nicole, I just, I love my time with you. And this has been such mm. a rich conversation today. Uh, anything else? Uh, before I let you go, that you want to leave with the listeners today. This is, uh, I think this is a critical conversation for people mm -hmm. to have, to process, to hold space for, because uh, we are coming through uh, a really mm -hmm. hard couple of years. And I think collective right. grief and collective trauma is real, and we have to learn how to reorient ourselves, as you've been mm -hmm. saying, to truth. So, Absolutely. I think one thing that I want listeners to take from this conversation, just... Um, the truth that I want to press into their palms, if they're listening and they're feeling like, oh, I'm still just so, I'm walking through this thing that if you only knew how hard it was to find joy and I'm trying and it's just, I feel discouraged because it's hard to access. Um, the truth that I want to press into your palms is God's faithfulness does not depend on your faith. God's goodness to you is not a function of your goodness. So this is this joy and celebration. This is a gift to us that we've been given as another avenue to connect with our creator that often we're not accessing, but it is not about performance. This is not about earning God's faithfulness or the goodness of, of God, he will be good and faithful regardless of how we show up. Um, my, my encouragement is that there's just a lot of joy and connection and delight to be found um, in our journey toward connecting with him in whatever circumstances we might find ourselves in. So that's where I want to end. For people that want to stay connected to you, tell us how to do that. Yes, I love hearing from listeners and readers. I try to respond to every message I get. I, I don't do that perfectly, but I, I really love the conversations that continue after conversations like this one. So my website's a great place to reach out, Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E-Z-A-S-O-W-S-K-I.com. And I'm just at Nicole Zazowski on Instagram. Um, that's the social media platform I hang out the most on. Um, but certainly Facebook as well, wherever you feel comfortable. Um, and Chris, you know that you're you're one of my faves. And so sweet. thank Thanks. you for making space for this conversation and for asking such good, deep questions. You're very gifted. And Thanks, keep, keep doing what you're doing because you're blessing a lot of people. Thank you, Nicole. I love my time with Nicole, and I hope that conversation added value to your life. If so, go to wintoday.tv slash episode 284 right now. That's wintoday.tv slash episode 284. Get a copy of Nicole's new book. And as I mentioned, there's an opportunity there and to join me over at the Art of Leadership Academy. Go check that out, artofleadershipacademy.com. Use the promo code WINTODAY. And lastly, listen. Thousands of people have joined the inner circle of readers who receive my weekly email, Win the Week. It's all about mental health, emotional health, and your spiritual growth. It can be read and applied in less than five minutes. Go get it today over at wintoday.tv. We'll listen next week here on the podcast. Dr. Elizabeth Stanley, a counterintelligence specialist and trauma specialist, joins me to talk all about stress, trauma, and why sucking it up is so bad for your health. Here's a preview. I couldn't not do that. That was all I knew how to do. I'd spent decades learning how to suck it up and drive on. And even in times when I wasn't in a stressful situation, I'm still sucking it up and driving on because that's the only habit I had ever been taught. It took me a while to learn other habits to counteract that. And ultimately that's what we want is the flexibility that we can access that capacity during an extreme event but that we don't have to live that way all the time because it's the living that way all the time that's the problem. Listen, her book, Widen the Window, literally changed my life and I cannot wait to share this conversation with you next week. Don't miss it. Thanks again for joining me this week. 
I believe you should be able to live at your best in your relationships, in your mental and emotional health, and in your personal and spiritual growth. Self-help and life hacks help, but they will not turn the key to total life transformation that lasts. And creating a plan for sustainable transformation is what Win Today is all about. That's why I'd like to invite you to join the inner circle of readers on my email list who receive weekly strategies for growth. Just go to wintoday.tv right now to sign up. It's absolutely free. Lastly, whether you're a new listener or have been listening to the show for a while, I'd really appreciate your rating and review of Win Today on Spotify and on the Apple Podcast app. Until next week, let's connect on social media and on my YouTube channel, and of course, at wintoday.tv. Thanks again for listening today. I hope you have an awesome week. We'll talk to you again really soon. Bye-bye.